It was a Monday afternoon in early December when I received the call that changed my life. When I answered the phone, a man said, Is this Alan Baxter? It is. Can I help you? I replied. He said, The husband of Lisa Baxter? Becoming a little concerned, I replied, Yes, is something wrong? He said, Unfortunately, I'm calling to tell you about the inappropriate relationship your wife is having with a man down at the extra point. At first, I was stunned, then annoyed by what seemed like an obvious prank call. Who the hell are you, and why are you telling me this? I asked. He said, this is no joke. Your wife is meeting another guy on Friday nights at the disco. I knew this couldn't be true, not about my wife, but an uneasy feeling came over me. Something was going on that I did not understand. I needed to think but required time. I'm not alone. Can you call me back in 20 minutes? I asked. Okay, he said, and hung up. I stood there with the phone in my hand. My arms and legs started to shake, and a cold sweat broke out. My heart raced, but my thoughts felt like molasses. I sat down and put my head in my hands. There couldn't be anything to this, could there? I had been married to Lisa for six and a half years. We have a beautiful six-year-old daughter named Maddie who is the center of our world. Yes, Maddie came a little early, Lisa was pregnant when we got married. We met during the fall term at the local community college. I was 20, and she was 18. Lisa was a first-year nursing student. I had completed two years of business and accounting but lost my student draft deferment for being five credits behind where the selective service guidelines said I should be. Even though I lived at home, I had worked full-time every other term to help pay my tuition. Vietnam was in full swing, and needless to say, the draft board was not sympathetic. I was just hanging around the college, taking a couple of classes but mostly playing cards with my buddies in the commons, expecting my draft notice to show up any day. The truth is, I was an indifferent student and more than a little bored with school. I had some money in the bank and was young, naive, and thought that getting away from home and out in the world wouldn't be all bad. One of the guys I was playing cards with nudged me and said, Look at that, pointing at the cafeteria line. There was a girl standing there with long brown hair and a short skirt and great legs. He said, that's Lisa Hartwell. She was two years behind us in high school. As I studied her, I thought to myself, damn, she's cute. As soon as she sat down, we walked over, and he introduced me. The three of us sat for a while and talked. The two of them had grown up in the same neighborhood and mostly talked about their old gang while I listened and admired the view. Eventually, she said she had to get to class, smiled at both of us, and left. I was instantly attracted to her. She was about 5 feet 7 inches and 115 pounds, with a dancer's body, long and lean. It turned out dancing was her hobby, and she had performed in a couple of high school musicals. She wasn't pretty in a classic sense, but was attractive and sexy. She had a big smile, an easy personality, and obvious sex appeal. She would talk to anybody and could instantly make you feel like she was interested in you. In high school, I was part of the nerd crowd, not very outgoing and didn't make new friends easily. I read a lot, but only got mediocre grades. I was not lazy, so I always had a job and took pride in having my own money and transportation. Other than one girlfriend for a few months in my junior year, I only dated a few times. I was tall, 6 feet 3 inches, weighed 195 pounds, wore glasses, and was kind of ordinary looking. I enjoyed sports but was not very good at them. I had never learned to dance, didn't have an expensive car, and was never really comfortable talking to girls, so I never attracted much attention. During my freshman year of college, I dated a girl I had met at my summer job. She was good-looking, smart, and a sophomore at a nearby university on a scholarship. She was also very religious, dancing, drinking, or sex were not part of her belief system. Strangely enough, she loved to make out. About once a week, after going to dinner, a concert, or the movies, we would go parking somewhere and make out like monkeys in the back seat. She also made sure I kept my hands away from her good parts. Every night, I would go home with a case of blue balls. Toward the end of the school year, she was offered a summer job in Maine. We both knew this wasn't going to go any further, 
so we decided not to get back together when she came back to school. After that, other than school and work, my social activities revolved around hanging out with the guys, beach parties, weekends at the lake, weather permitting, occasional poker nights, and college keggers. I kind of took to partying more than was probably good for me. I know I gave my parents fits some weekends when I stumbled home in the wee hours of the morning. I finally lost my virginity to a girl I met at the lake during one of those beach parties. Thanks to more than a few beers on both our parts, she lived about 80 miles away, so we only got together about half a dozen times. I had been her first, too, so we never really explored the wilder aspects of sex. It was fun, but when she went downstate to college at the end of the summer, our relationship just sort of faded away. A few days after meeting Lisa, I saw her sitting alone in the commons, so I walked over to her table and sat down. We talked for a while, and I really felt the attraction. She told me about deciding to go into nursing since she had been working in hospitals since she was old enough to be a candy striper. She lived at home to save money, as her dad was on disability. We talked about our families and really hit it off. Finally, I asked her if she would like to go out with me for a movie and pizza the coming weekend. She said she was free on Saturday. I said great and would pick her up at 7 o'clock, so that started it. After our second date, we ended up parking off one of the county's back roads and making out. She was so hot. After being in a clinch for a while, my hands started to wander. She finally pushed me away, sat back against the door, and said, let's talk about it. I mumbled, first thing that comes up, and she laughed. Well, I had to laugh too. That cooled things down for the evening. A couple of weeks later, I was visiting her at her house, and we started to get into it. Her parents had gone to bed, but it was a small house, and you knew whatever happened in one part of the house could be heard in every part. I suggested we go for a ride, so we drove over to a secluded wood a few miles away. We climbed into the back seat and were all over each other. We quickly got undressed. After a bit, I pulled back and looked around for my wallet. Lisa was almost panting, what are you doing? I'm looking for a condom, I said. Don't worry, she said, I'm two days away from my period. I'm safe. I thought to myself, she's a nursing student, so she should know. We made love. Man, I had never felt anything so good. It was my first time without a condom, and there was just no comparison. Once done, we lay there holding each other, both of us feeling something special had occurred. After that, I was whipped. We talked on the phone almost every day, went out once or twice a week, and almost always ended the night making love. It wasn't just sex, I didn't know if it was love, but it was close. A friend of mine with his own apartment would let me use it on weekends when he went up north to visit his parents. We would make love three or four times a night before I had to get her home. Lisa was totally uninhibited, energetic, vocal, and multi-orgasmic. We both enjoyed taking showers together and making love in just about every position we had heard about. I was not her first, but she said there had been only one other guy she had dated in Florida during spring break. A few weeks later, the end of the college term and my draft notice arrived at about the same time. I had to report to the processing center in 30 days. Lisa got all weepy when I told her and said she loved me. Up to that point, I had avoided saying the L word, but I had to admit I thought I loved her too. About a week before I was to leave, we were out, and Lisa had this nervous look on her face. Alan, I need to tell you something. I'm late for my period. I thought, oh, somehow I never thought about birth control or condoms after that first night. Neither of us had brought it up, so I assumed she was safe and on the pill or something. I just sat there, trying to think of something to say. Lisa looked at the ground, and tears started running down her face. I felt so bad. I reached out, wrapped her in my arms, and hugged and kissed her. After a while, she settled down, and we started talking about our different options. For some reason, neither of us mentioned marriage. We decided that if she were pregnant, she would either have an abortion or have the baby and put it up for adoption. In either event, one of Lisa's brothers and his wife lived down in Alabama, so she thought she could go live with them for a while. Maybe she could keep the pregnancy from her friends and the rest of the family. I said I thought that might be best. I had some money put away, and as soon as my army pay kicked in, I could send her some more. 
Neither of us was happy that night, and I took her home without our usual passionate ending. Lisa went to the doctor a couple of days later and confirmed it. We made tentative plans for her to go down south after I went in the army. I gave her most of everything I had in the bank, which, with what money she had, should take care of her needs. We went out the night before I left and made love over and over in a quiet kind of desperation. When I dropped her off at home, Lisa clung to me and whispered, I am so scared, Alan. I love you more than anything. As I drove away, I felt about as low as I ever had in my life. About six hours later, I, along with a couple of hundred other nervous, sleep-deprived, and, in many cases, hungover guys, reported to the induction center. After processing, we were sworn into the army, handed a box lunch, put on buses, and made the 10-hour drive to Fort Knox, Kentucky. We stumbled off the bus around midnight, being screamed at by a half-dozen no-nonsense drill instructors. We were hustled through a line to pick a bedding and then shoved into an old World War II barracks to sleep on bunks nearly as old. Now, during Vietnam, Army basic combat training consisted of about one week of in-processing and orientation, followed by six weeks of military training. Advanced individual training would follow after that for whatever specialty you chose or the Army had chosen for you. Basic training included all the usual things everyone has heard of, physical fitness training, rifle instruction and qualification, obstacle course, drill and ceremony, land navigation, map reading, hygiene, and dozens of other necessary military topics. I found the trick to surviving basic training was to keep your mouth shut, do what you were told, and sleep when you got the chance. We were always exhausted from the high-speed, high-stress environment. I was a couple of years older than the average recruit, with two years of college, so I was made a squad leader after the first one crashed and burned in week two. He had a sudden epiphany that he was a conscientious objector and was against the war. I think he was just a little late with that call. Meanwhile, Lisa was writing me daily. The highlight of our day was mail call. One thing about the army, they never stood between a soldier and his mail. She told me over and over how much she loved me and kept me up to date on her progress in moving to Alabama, or lack thereof. She said her sister-in-law wore the pants in that family and was not being cooperative. She was reluctant to get involved in her problems and was trying to convince Lisa to tell her parents. Lisa's folks always treated me okay, but they were chain-smoking, beer-drinking factory workers from way back. Her father, brother, and brother-in-law were bona fide alcoholics who cheated on their spouses fought anyone at the drop of a hat, and if not actually abused their kids, at least neglected them. Her mother and sister spent most of their time trying to keep up with the menfolk. Lisa was the baby in the family and seemed to have escaped the worst of the family influence. She never developed a taste for beer and quit smoking as soon as she found out I didn't like girls who did. Somehow, I just did not get a warm and fuzzy feeling about them finding out I'd knocked up their baby daughter. As the weeks rolled by, I was totally involved in getting through training, but every night I was bombarded with letters from Lisa, getting more and more desperate over the pregnancy. Between basic training and her letters, my gut was always in a knot. I frequently wrote back and called her whenever we were given phone privileges. She kept trying to work things out with her sister-in-law but was getting nowhere. At the time, if your training went well, each company was promised a 48-hour weekend pass after week four. Lo and behold, on that Thursday, we were told we would be released Friday night and would not be due back until Sunday night. However, the terms of the pass stated you were not to go further than 50 miles from post or you would be considered AWOL. There were six of us in my platoon who all lived in the same county and wanted to get home to see our wives or girlfriends. So, we all chipped in and rented a car and hit the road. It was more like 500 miles to home than 50. After eight hours of driving, I was dropped off at my parents' house at about two o'clock in the morning. I got about six hours of sleep and then headed over to see Lisa. Her parents had gone up to the lake where they kept a trailer, so we were able to be alone. She started crying when she saw me at the door and held onto me like she thought she would never see me again. We went back to her bed, threw our clothes off, made love, talked, made love again, and talked some more. It had come down to her sister-in-law wouldn't let her come to Alabama, and she thought she was almost ten weeks along, almost too far along for an abortion. As we made love that last time that morning, she started crying and said, I don't want to kill our baby. That stopped me in mid-stroke. 
I realized that I had only one option left. I knew I couldn't abandon her. Finally, I said, Lisa, do you want to get married? Not the most romantic of proposals for sure. She wiped her eyes and whispered, I don't want you to feel you have to marry me. I assured her I didn't, and I thought this would be the best solution. As much as I dreaded it, I would tell my parents before I left the next day to return to Fort Knox. She would have to tell her parents and start making plans for the wedding. I told her whatever arrangement she wanted to make would be fine with me, but she couldn't set a date until I knew where I was going after basic training. With the decision made, we were able to relax a little and think about what this meant. Was it love? I thought so. I knew I wanted to be with her, and that's all there was to it. The next morning, I caught mom and dad before they left for church and got the hard part over with. What made it easier was that my older brother had gotten married two years before when he got his girlfriend pregnant. Things were tense for quite a while, but they finally came around, and things worked out. When their baby came, everything was forgiven. I have to say a few things about my family. Dad was a mid-level supervisor for a manufacturing company, and Mom was a full-time homemaker and part-time teacher's aide. They did pretty well financially, always had a nice home, and were able to provide the necessities for us four boys. They were active in church and PTA while I was growing up. We were expected to attend church every Sunday. As soon as I was old enough to get a job, I figured out if I had to work on Sunday, I could get out of it. I always tried to work on Sundays. They didn't smoke, rarely swore or drank, were very family-oriented, and we never doubted they loved us. So when I told them that Lisa and I were going to get married, they had been over this ground before. Mom simply asked, Do you have to? Don't have to, Mom, but Lisa is pregnant, I replied. Dad just got this grim look on his face, and Mom shook her head. Have Lisa call me this week, and we can talk about your plans while you're off playing soldier. Then they left for church. I ran over to Lisa to spend a couple of hours with her, then met up with the guys for the drive back down south. As graduation approached, I received orders to Fort Polk, Louisiana, for my advanced individual training. The Army, in its infinite wisdom, decided I was to receive eight weeks of on-the-job training to be an administrative assistant in the post-adjutant general's office. I always figured it was because I had a couple of years of college and knew how to type. The best thing was I could have up to seven days leave before reporting. I called Lisa and asked her if that was enough time to have the wedding. Lisa, her mother, and my mother had things well in hand and managed to pull it together. We had a nice church wedding, not too large, with a reception following. Lisa was a beautiful bride, and the dress she bought was loose enough to hide her beginning baby bump. Her dad supplied a keg, and most of her family was drunk by the end of the night. Lisa and I had a three-day quickie honeymoon, and then I got on a plane for Fort Polk. We decided that Lisa would continue to live at home until I finished training and received a permanent assignment. She also decided not to return to college and went back to working full-time as a ward clerk at the hospital. Fort Polk was a hellhole. It had recently been reactivated as an infantry training post because of Vietnam, hot, muggy, with cockroaches as big as your thumb. But I was working inside in an air-conditioned office, mostly as a glorified clerk typist. My time there went by quickly. After about six weeks, I got orders to report to Germany at the end of my training. I couldn't believe my luck. Most of the guys coming out of AIT were being ordered to Vietnam. I had a delay in reporting to my new assignment, so I was able to spend ten days at home. Lisa was about six months along but still sexy as hell and horny all the time. My plan was to request leave for the birth of the baby as soon as I got to my new unit. Lisa was going to stay with her parents until the last month of her pregnancy and then move to my folks' house. They had a couple of extra bedrooms that could better accommodate her and the baby. I flew over and was assigned as a maintenance clerk in an armored unit. It was another OJT assignment but looked like it would be easy to learn. We were located on a small base near the East German border. It was the height of the Cold War, and our unit's primary assignment was to patrol the border, which we did about one week out of six. I spent the next few months mostly trying to stay straight enough not to get into trouble. The hatch of available beer in Germany at the time was the best in the world and cheap. It helped us forget our horniness. 
If you didn't stay stone cold sober, the temptation to visit the legal red light area in Würzburg or Nuremberg was overwhelming. I flew home a couple of days before Lisa's due date. She was as big as a house. She went into labor four days later. The delivery went well, and we soon had a beautiful baby girl we named Meline. When I first looked at her, I could tell my life would never be the same. I hung around for about a week after the birth and enjoyed every minute of it. We made plans for her and the baby to come to Germany as soon as Meline was old enough to travel. Everything came together finally, and about three months later, I was meeting my family at the Frankfurt airport. Living in Germany as a junior enlisted man with dependents was a struggle too. Junior enough to be ineligible for military housing, we rented an apartment in a little village about 10 kilometers from the base. I had bought an old convertible VW Beetle whose body was about three different shades of blue and was probably on its fifth or sixth engine. Our furniture was old, beat up rejects from base housing or castoffs from other soldiers transferring out. We had no television, just a multi band radio. My pay was just enough to cover basic necessities with a little left over to go to the movies once a month. Gas was cheap, so many weekends we would go day tripping through the German countryside. Our only other entertainment was each other. Maddie was a wonder. She was a happy baby almost all the time and would sleep 10 to 12 hours a night. Lisa was a great mom, and of course, she was with her all day long, but when I got home, I would spend almost every minute she was awake playing with her. When she wasn't awake, Lisa and I played with each other. Our evenings were like the honeymoon we never had. For ten months, interrupted only by the times I had to do a border patrol rotation, we made love nearly every night in every way possible. I grew to know Lisa's body better than my own, and what a body she had. She had regained her figure quickly after Maddie was born, her hips were a little fuller, her breasts a little rounder, but she still complained about how small they were. Yet there wasn't a stretch mark or blemish on her. She could turn on a dead man most times. Lisa was as enthusiastic and eager for sex as I was. She loved to tease me until Maddie was asleep. Making love was fantastic. Some nights, we would fall asleep spooning and then wake up later in the night or in the morning to go at it again. It wasn't just the sex, it seemed like we came to know each other so well we could finish each other's sentences. When we looked at each other, we almost always knew what the other was thinking. We never really had a fight. We would disagree at times but never did we get angry. We talked about anything and everything, what we wanted out of life, what we wanted for Maddie, what we wanted to do when we got back home. We looked out for each other and did our best to make each other happy. The emotional bond we developed convinced me that this was forever. I couldn't imagine being without her, and I was convinced she felt the same way. With my tour coming to an end, I was offered a promotion if I would re-enlist, but we both wanted to go back to the world, be with family and friends, return to school, start a career, and get on with our lives. It was a great experience, and I was proud of my service, but it was time to move on. What a relief it was to be home after being gone for two years. We moved in with my parents for a couple of months until we could get back on our feet. I got a temporary second shift job at the local auto plant and enrolled back into college. Between the VA benefits and work, we would do all right. We bought a car, rented a townhouse, and secured used furniture from family and friends. Living with my parents had put a serious crimp in our sex life, but after getting into our own place, things picked up again. It never really got back to the honeymoon fever we had experienced in Germany, but it was still pretty great. Two to three times a week was our usual frequency. We continued to enjoy making love in a variety of ways. We were always affectionate with each other, we held hands when walking together, touched and caressed each other frequently, and often cuddled on the couch watching television. From time to time, the subject of having another child would come up, but neither of us seemed to want to commit to it. We had gotten into the habit of going out to the live rock and roll bars near campus with several other couples about twice a month. Now, you have to know that for me to dance, it required liberal amounts of alcohol and lots of people dancing around me. After a few drinks, Lisa would get me out on the dance floor, and we would really boogie. Slow dancing didn't bother me, being able to hold Lisa was my inspiration and made me better than I actually was. But fast dancing, I was pretty much a typical white boy, few moves and rhythmically challenged. Lisa, on the other hand, could really shake it. 
Invariably, she was dressed to kill and so hot she could make a grown man cry. After a night out, I usually couldn't wait to get her home and in bed. For the next few years, I continued to go to college part-time and worked a variety of jobs. Within a couple of terms, I finished my requirements for my associate degree and transferred to Michigan State to work toward a BA. I held several temporary second shift jobs in the winter months, but during the warm season, I mostly worked for several construction firms. Strangely enough, I found that I liked the construction jobs the most. Working outside, operating heavy equipment, and doing physical labor gave me a lot of satisfaction. I had met a couple of other veterans at school who were doing about the same thing I was. John and Craig were best friends and had even been the best men in each other's weddings. We were all married and had small kids, and we started socializing together along with five or six other couples. From time to time, we had barbecues, pool parties, chili cookouts, mostly family-type get-togethers. Craig was working in a residential construction business owned by his wife's father, and John had worked for several heavy construction companies in the area before and after going into the service, so he knew his way around the construction business. One day, John came to me with a proposal, we would both contribute a couple of thousand dollars and incorporate a construction company. We would combine his experience and mine, along with my college background in business and accounting. He suggested we focus mostly on landscaping and maybe some underground work to start, and we could subcontract to several building contractors, including Craig's company. The thought of working for ourselves was very appealing, and the possibility of making some serious money was attractive. Lisa and I talked it over and decided to go for it. Lisa had done some childcare out of our home until Maddie was about four and ready for preschool. She then decided to return to hospital work, but we were pretty much living paycheck to paycheck. We had moved a couple of times and were now living in a nice duplex. We owned our furniture, a three-year-old car, and a four WD pickup truck, that was pretty much it. The work was interesting, and we were busy about eight months of the year. We hired four or five guys to work on projects as needed. Living in the snow belt pretty much shut down most dirt-type construction projects when the frost got in the ground, but we collected unemployment during the down months and did some cash-under-the-table casual work, so we were never hurting too badly. Of course, I was still collecting some VA education benefits. Early on, John and I had gotten into the habit of going to happy hour at various bars after work on Fridays to pound down a few drinks. We were usually joined by a bunch of other construction types, including Craig. John and Craig were pretty hard beer drinkers, to the point of being alcoholics. I was usually satisfied with a mild buzz from a couple of mixed drinks. It also turned out that they both were players when given the opportunity. I was kind of shocked to find out John was regularly having an affair with one of the wives in our social circle, and Craig was having an affair with the sister of one of the guys in our same group. His biggest claim to fame was that he had bagged his wife's younger sister the first year of their marriage, or so he claimed. They both openly admitted they had hit on about every decent-looking female they knew, and quite a few who were not so decent. Frequently, after a couple of beers or six, they would brag openly about their exploits. I have to admit that those stories intrigued me, and I wondered what it would be like to get into something strange. Occasionally, during those happy hours, I met a few women, had a few drinks with them, or even danced with them. But when I compared them with Lisa, they just didn't stack up. I just couldn't see taking the risk when I had something better at home. I always looked forward to going home to my wife. By the time we started the business, disco had finally made its way into the Midwest. Our rock and roll clubs were slowly changing, and Lisa embraced the new music wholeheartedly. It fit in with her dance background, and she picked up all the new dances easily. By the second year we were in business, many of the rock bars were gone, and the discos were in. I had gone out with her a couple of times to some of them, but I just couldn't get into it. Not only did I not have the talent for it, but I also didn't feel comfortable in that scene. I was a flannel shirt and blue jeans kind of guy, not silk shirts and John Travolta suits. I had been working construction for several years now, and at 6 feet 3 inches I weighed about 230 pounds. I was big, with a lot of muscle, big arms, shoulders, and chest. During the off-season, I belonged to the local YMCA and played racquetball and lifted weights to stay in shape. I had long hair and a full beard. Lisa said I resembled Paul Bunyan, 
but Maddie thought I was just one big cuddly bear. Lisa, on the other hand, had only improved in looks with age. She could eat anything she wanted and not gain a pound. She loved nice clothes and was a regular clothes horse. She could wear anything and look sexy in it. One of the few things we argued about was how much she spent on her wardrobe. With her appearance, dance talent, and personality, she fit right into the disco scene. Since I had no interest in disco, Lisa had gotten into the habit of going out one night a week with several other girls from the hospital. They would have a few drinks, enjoy the music, and maybe dance a little. That routine eventually developed into one where, on Fridays, I would get home from happy hour with the guys around 7 or 8, and Lisa would then leave to meet the girls at one of the clubs for the rest of the evening. I would stay home with Maddie. Around the time Lisa got interested in the disco scene, she decided she wanted breast implants. One of our previous neighbors, who was around her age, had gotten them done, and Lisa was fascinated by how it changed her figure. I didn't think it was necessary and argued with her about it. She insisted she felt she was flat-chested and would look and feel better about herself if she had it done. Our insurance would cover the hospitalization but not the surgeon's fee, and it was not an expense we could really afford. But she convinced me, and she went through with it. The change wasn't huge, probably a 34B to a 34C cup size, but she did look good with it, and she really filled out a bikini. Lisa was more than pleased with the results. The construction season was over, and it was the end of our second full year in the business. I was working from home, closing out the books and preparing balance statements, tax forms, and W-2s. We had kept busy for eight of the last 12 months, made a profit, paid all our bills, and had some cash in the bank. But when you figured out all the hours John and I put in during the year, it seemed we only made about 50 cents an hour, certainly not the big money I was hoping for. Lisa and I had been talking about buying a house. We were tired of renting. Maddie was now six and in first grade, and the subject of giving her a brother or sister came up again. Lisa was doing well at the hospital, had changed jobs a couple of times, and got promoted each time, with each promotion bringing an increase in pay. Truth be told, her salary probably exceeded my combined wage, unemployment, and veterans tuition benefits for the year. I couldn't help but wonder where our construction business was going. I only needed a few classes to complete my bachelor's degree. Maybe it was time to consider doing something else. Then, just after the Thanksgiving holidays, I answered an anonymous phone call that changed everything. As I sat there trying not to be sick, all this flashed through my mind. I kept mumbling to myself, what the hell? I did not want to accept that there could be something to this, but something told me I had missed something, that something had changed this past year. I shook my head, trying to clear the fog. I needed a plan and needed to be prepared for when he called back. I grabbed a pad of paper and started making a list of questions I needed answers to. After a bit, I just sat there staring at the sheet of paper, hoping that it would just go away. When the phone rang, it startled me. I grabbed it and said hello. Are you alone now? Yes. Your wife Lisa goes to the extra point most Friday nights, doesn't she? The caller asked. Yes, she does. I dreaded hearing the next words. She has been having an affair down there with a man named Dan Burus for several months now. Putting a name to him somehow made it more real. How do you know? He laughed. They don't exactly keep it a secret. Everyone in that crowd knows what's going on. Damn. My thoughts kept bouncing between disbelief, anger, panic, and denial. Why are you telling me this? Are you making this up because you're pissed at this guy, or did you hit on Lisa and she shut you down? He got angry. I'm not making anything up. And never mind why. I just thought you ought to know. Oh, sure you do, I thought. So, when and where is this happening? Most nights they head out to his custom van between 11 and 12. He's got it set up as a real bedroom on wheels. They don't usually come back to the club. With a sick feeling, I remembered waking up and hearing Lisa coming in after 2 a.m. a couple of Friday nights. When I asked her about it later, she just shrugged and said she stayed for the last set the band played. How long has this been going on? I heard it started about midsummer, maybe earlier. Is this Dan married? Yep, but he says his old lady doesn't care. 
They get together. Any other times or places? A couple of times they didn't stay in the parking lot after they left the club. I heard him say they went to his house one time, and he said they met for lunch a few times. He paused for a second and added, then there was the sailing weekend. Sailing weekend? What the hell are you talking about? I guess one weekend last August, Dan, Lisa, and two other couples went out on a big sailboat on Lake Michigan. I heard they had quite a time. It was like a big puzzle, one piece would fall into place, making a fit for several others. My mom and dad had asked me to come up to their lake cottage last August and help build a deck. Lisa's department had to cover Sundays at the hospital, so usually one Sunday a month she had to work. That weekend happened to fall on her Sunday. I left Friday night and took Maddie with me. Mom and dad never missed a chance to see one of their grandkids. Lisa said she thought she would go to the beach at Grand Haven on Saturday with Connie, one of her friends from the hospital. In fact, she said she might decide to stay the night with her and leave from her house to go to work on Sunday morning. I couldn't believe it. Lisa is scared to be on the water. She can barely stand to set foot on a pontoon boat. Maybe they never left the marina, but whatever they did, I heard it was a hell of a party. The implications of this story started to sink in. If it was true, then Lisa had actually lied to me. And if she had lied about this, what else had she lied about? Where does this Dan Burus live? Oh no, I'm not going to be responsible for you doing something stupid. Besides, he's listed in the phone book. What does he look like? He's about 6 feet 1 inch or 6 feet 2 inches, probably about 180 pounds. He's 32, has blonde hair combed back, is in good physical condition, a good dancer, and a decent looking guy. Quite a smooth operator and makes a lot of money. Anything else you know about them? Well, from what I heard, I have the feeling he isn't the first to get his fingers into her pie. She's pretty popular down there, but Dan monopolizes her time now. She's not the first he has gotten into his van, that's for sure, but she is the first he has ever talked about like he was in love with her. He's talking about my wife. I wanted to puke. Angrily, I said, I can't believe this. Lisa isn't like that. Hey man, I'm sorry about this, but if it were me, I'd want to know. He actually said it with some sympathy, which just made me feel worse. Yeah, right. I slammed the phone down. I don't know how long I sat there, but the next thing I knew, Maddie was coming in the door from school. I pulled myself out of my funk long enough to give her a desperate hug and admire the schoolwork she had brought home. Eventually, I got her settled down with a snack and some cartoons on television. As I watched her, I felt my eyes tear up as I thought about what might happen to us. Was it possible that Lisa could be involved in something like this? Lisa would be home in a couple of hours. As I started dinner, I kept going over that conversation in my mind. The caller knew too many details to be discounted. I decided I did not want a confrontation yet. Part of it was fear of the unknown, part of it was still hoping and praying this was all a misunderstanding. But whatever it was, I needed to know the truth. As I thought about the call, I started thinking about what had changed in the last year or so. Lisa had always been something of a flirt. She would talk to anyone and wasn't shy. She enjoyed dirty jokes as much as anybody we knew. I know she got a kick out of the attention she received from other men. We had talked and laughed about it several times. I never believed anything could come of it. When I was out drinking with the guys, the topic of sex would always come up. Lisa was probably one of the best-looking women in our social circle. A couple of times, when the guys were half-bagged, I heard hints and rumors about her flirtatious ways and thinly-veiled references to her fooling around. I always attributed those comments to alcohol and envy. Could there be more to it? Another thing I had noticed was that when Lisa first started going out with the girls to the clubs, she would always be home before midnight. Sometimes, I would still be awake and she would want to make love. Sometimes, she would even wake me. If we didn't make love when she got home, we would for sure in the morning. But when she started coming home later and later, all that stopped. We never made love on Saturdays anymore, Sunday became the norm. In fact, she rarely made it out of bed before 11 a.m. on Saturdays unless I was working and she had to watch Maddie. Another thing I noticed this past year was that Lisa seemed to exude more self-confidence than she ever had before. 
Maybe it was her improved figure or the way she dressed more professionally to fit her latest job promotion. She didn't seem to care about going up to mom and dad's cabin as much as she used to. I had the feeling she had less interest in what I was doing and how the construction business was going. While waiting for Lisa to get home, I looked up Dan Burus in the phone book. I found a Daniel and Patricia Burus listed in Grand Ledge, a nearby well-to-do suburb. Seeing it gave me another chill. I wrote down the number and address, collected all the notes from the phone call, and put them in my briefcase. I put on my game face and tried to act as if nothing unusual had happened that day. Somehow, I got through the evening. Lisa was as affectionate as ever, kissing me as she came in the door, slipping me a little tongue, and grabbing my butt. I kept looking at her to see if I could see something different, but there was nothing. She chattered on about her day at the hospital and the upcoming Christmas party our friends were having. She talked, laughed, and played with Maddie. Maddie wanted to put up the Christmas tree, and we kept trying to convince her it was too early. Later that night, I just lay awake in bed, trying to forget. Lisa cuddled up to me like she usually does and went right to sleep. The next morning, after Maddie left for school and Lisa for work, I got out my notes. I reviewed everything that was said and everything I had remembered. I decided I needed to search the house for clues. I went through Lisa's closet and dresser drawers, our storage boxes in the basement, and looked at our old charge account bills, telephone bills, and checking account statements. Nothing stood out. I looked through our correspondence drawer, loose note cards, and miscellaneous bits and pieces of paper, again, nothing. I got out our address book and started going through it. I didn't find anything until I got to the section for names starting with Z. Like most people, we didn't know anyone whose last name started with Z. On the second blank page after Z, I found a half dozen pencil entries in Lisa's handwriting that were just initials followed by one or two phone numbers. One of the entries was DB, and the first number matched Dan Burus's number listed in the phone book. I felt like I had just been punched in the gut. I sat there staring at the page. At first, I was angry, then, I became sad and depressed. As inconceivable as it seemed, I had to accept the fact that my wife had a secret life I had no idea existed, a life that probably included behavior in direct conflict with our marriage vows. She thought so little of me that she actually wrote the evidence in our address book. I had to believe the story my unknown caller had told me was mostly true. If it was true, could I put it behind me? Would I be able to forgive her? With a sinking feeling, I didn't think we could put the genie back in the bottle. What about Maddie? Whatever happened, she would be the most affected. With what I now had, I figured I could find out the who, what, and where, but why could only be discovered through direct confrontation with Lisa. I had three days left before she went out again on Friday. I needed to get as many answers as possible before then. I had to know my options and be prepared to make a decision and follow through with it. I couldn't let this drag on, it was eating me up inside. I had a high school buddy who had completed law school and was clerking for a local judge while waiting to take the bar exam. I gave him a call and he referred me to a divorce attorney who would give me a free consultation. I set up an appointment for Friday morning. I started calling the numbers I found in our address book to try to figure out all the players. It was easy to pretend to be a wrong number or a sales solicitor. I was right about the second number under DB. It was the number for a business machine service company. From what I got out of the receptionist, it was a sales rep. The other names associated with the numbers were not familiar to me, except for CM. It turned out to be her friend Connie from the hospital. That evening, I told Lisa I had to visit a job site we were going to bid on and would be gone for a couple of hours. I drove to the Buru's address and parked a few houses down. It was in an upscale residential neighborhood. There was one car in the driveway when I arrived, a recent model BMW. About 20 minutes later, a maroon custom Chevy van pulled in. A well-dressed man got out who fit the description of Dan Burus and walked into the house. I could now put a face to the name. I drove slowly by and wrote down the license plate number. Getting through the rest of the week was tough. I avoided going to bed when Lisa did. The thought of making love to her was depressing. Lisa sensed I was stressed and kept asking if something was wrong. I told her I was feeling some pressure to get all the end-of-year tax forms done early and that some of the accounts didn't balance. She accepted my story without comment. 
The fact was, the IRS and John, my partner, could care less as long as everything was filed by April 15th. I spent as much time with Maddie as I could. I was afraid of the changes the future would bring. On Thursday evening during dinner, Lisa casually said, Are you going out for happy hour on Friday as usual? On the spur of the moment, I said, I don't know. For some reason, I just don't feel like it this week. Why don't we skip this Friday and do something together? Maybe the three of us could go somewhere. Without missing a beat, she said, Why, honey? It's kind of late to change plans. I promised Connie I would meet her at the club. She's bringing a girlfriend and wants me to meet someone who is interested in a position we have open at the hospital. I just sat there and felt so sad. She had fallen to making up stories to avoid missing out on meeting her lover. My feelings must have shown on my face. Oh, Alan, we can do something together on Saturday or Sunday. It's not the end of the world, she said with a little laugh. I smiled and said, you're right. It's not the end of the world. Not the end of the world, but maybe the end of our marriage. On Friday morning, I met with the attorney and explained my situation as I saw it. I needed to know what my legal options were. His first question was whether reconciliation was possible. My answer was that it was possible, but it would all depend on what came out of the upcoming confrontation. He explained that we lived in a no-fault state. This meant that the reasons for the divorce were immaterial for having a divorce granted. However, the reasons could matter when it came to matters of property division, alimony, and child custody. Given that Lisa's income was equal to or greater than mine, spousal support should not be an issue. Since our assets were minimal, division of property should not be an issue either. As far as custody was concerned, if the divorce went forward, I wanted joint custody of Maddie. In case Lisa contested it, proof of adultery or her unfitness as a mother would probably discourage any such action on her part. I told the lawyer I thought I could come up with something. As I sat at home that afternoon, I found myself wishing I could confide in someone, someone who could reassure me I was not overreacting and that this was as bad as I felt it was. I was too ashamed and embarrassed to tell anyone in my family. I thought about John and Craig, but with their history regarding fidelity, I wasn't likely to get any good advice from them. Besides, I couldn't trust them to keep their mouths shut after a couple of beers. I had set my plans in motion for the evening, so after finishing up some more business paperwork, I went out to the bar for happy hour. My head really wasn't in it, and after one drink, I switched to ginger ale and just sat back, watching everything going on around me. The view was depressing. Was this what I had to look forward to, hanging out in bars looking for companionship? Marriage had been good to me, it had made me happy. At least, I thought it had been good to me. Turns out I was clueless. I finally gave up in disgust and left for home. I pulled in before seven, and Maddie met me at the door by jumping into my arms and giving me a big kiss. Daddy, Daddy, you're home. Lisa came out of the bedroom dressed but still putting on her makeup. She looked at me closely, like she was trying to gauge my sobriety. I'm meeting Connie for dinner before we go to the club. There are leftovers on the stove, she said. I just grunted at her and made my way into the kitchen. Maddie chattered away about school and showed me some artwork she had made while I warmed up something to eat. As I sat there with Maddie, Lisa came in with her coat on, looking wonderful as usual. She made my heart ache just looking at her, thinking about what she was doing to us. She gave us both a kiss and said, You two have fun tonight. Love you both. Maddie said, I love you, mommy. I just said, bye. I wanted to ask her not to go again, but it would have been pointless. Lisa stopped at the door for a second and looked at me strangely, like she wanted to say something. Then she opened the door and stepped out. I waited about 15 minutes after listening to her car drive away, and then I got up and called the babysitter I had arranged earlier. I told her to come over in about 20 minutes. Then I sat down with Maddie and said, how would you like Carol to come and stay with you for a while? Maddie loved Carol, and she was all for it. You have to be a good girl for her and go to bed when she tells you, okay? Maddie nodded enthusiastically. I went into the bathroom and got out my shaving gear. I started shaving off my beard and mustache. Where I was going that night, I didn't want to be recognized. Maddie came in and looked at me. Daddy, what are you doing to your face? 
I'm making it all smooth like it was before you came along, sweetheart. Don't you like it? I had grown the beard right after getting out of the army, and she didn't remember me without it. I think I do, she said, sounding uncertain. My hair was still long, but I combed it back and away from my face. I gathered up some things I needed, and as soon as Carol arrived, I told her I had to leave but would be home between eleven and one. I gave Maddie a kiss and a hug and left. I drove over to my brother's house to trade vehicles. He had asked a few weeks ago if he could borrow the pickup sometime to move some stuff. A couple of days before, I told him he could have it this Friday night if he was willing to let me use his car. It worked out for both of us. He is also something of an amateur photographer, and I had asked him if I could borrow his camera with a zoom lens that would work in low light conditions. He questioned me about what I was going to shoot, but I just told him I would explain later if it worked out. He sent it up and gave me some pointers, and off I went. Snow flurries were coming down as I pulled into the club parking lot about 8.30. I cruised through until I found her car, all the way in the back in a dark corner. I didn't see the maroon van, so I thought maybe they were still at dinner. I hoped they hadn't decided to go somewhere else. I parked where I could get a good view out my side window and waited. About 30 minutes later, the van pulled in with another car close behind. They both parked near Lisa's car. Lisa and Dan got out of the van, and another couple got out of the car. I didn't know the other man, but I recognized the woman as Connie. Lisa had introduced me to her a couple of times. She was a cute blonde, divorced, and a couple of years younger than us. Lisa and Dan walked hand in hand, laughing and talking, and looking at each other with obvious affection. I got a couple of photos as they walked by me toward the entrance, watching them reinforce the sick feeling in the pit of my stomach. I waited a few minutes and got out of the car. I had dressed differently than I usually did, khaki pants and a dress shirt, with a long dark raincoat and a Panama hat. I figured if I kept my head down, the brim would hide my face. The disco crowd tended to dress pretty eclectically, so I thought I wouldn't stand out if I stayed in the shadows. I slung the camera around my neck and hid it under the coat. I walked to the entrance and paid the cover. I went right to the bar, glancing under the brim of my hat just enough to find my way. I bought a coke and started looking around. I figured if they came for the dancing, they would be near the dance floor and the DJ. I spotted them up front, they had put a couple of tables together and were sitting with six or eight others. I made my way around the back of the crowded bar, staying against the wall as much as possible. I found a table with a single bar stool against the wall about 30 feet behind them. It gave me a good view of their table and the floor. I needn't have worried about being recognized, the only light in the club was around the dance floor and the bar, which made it almost impossible for anyone else to be seen from a distance. It was apparent that they all knew each other. The women were hugging and kissing each other's cheeks, and the guys were laughing and joking around. Connie was the only person I recognized other than Lisa and Dan. I wondered if my whistleblower was one of this crowd. The music was playing, and most of the group paired up and moved out onto the floor. For the next three hours, I watched Lisa with her lover. It was obvious within the first hour that they were lovers. They danced, kissed, and held each other. They whispered in each other's ears. They danced together like they had been partners forever. God knows how many hours they must have practiced the fast and slow dances. They melted into each other's arms like they were one. I saw Lisa look into his eyes like she once looked into mine. At the end of each dance, she would kiss him slowly and tenderly, just like she once kissed me. I just sat there, all choked up, continually wiping the tears from my eyes. When they sat at the table, he would have his hand on her leg, and she would have her hand on the back of his head, slowly stroking his hair, her wedding rings glittering in the light, mocking me. When she stroked my hair like that, I would get an instant erection, which always amused her. As the evening progressed, they became more and more affectionate, and I knew how it was going to end. He would occasionally caress her when he thought no one was looking, and Lisa would tease him by rubbing his bulge or blowing into his ear. Then they would sit back and talk very earnestly, almost touching nose to nose. They were in their own private world, sharing their intimate thoughts. After three hours, I was emotionally exhausted. I had intended to follow them out to his van and witness the end of the evening but I couldn't stand it anymore. I had my answer, and it made me bitter. 
this wasn't just a physical relationship but a close emotional one as well. What I thought we had, what I thought we shared only with each other, she had given freely to him. She had already left me. I knew there could be no satisfactory explanation, no satisfactory solution to this. I had seen enough and had covertly taken enough pictures to prove to myself later, or to anyone else for that matter, that it wasn't my imagination. I took a sheet of paper out of my pocket and wrote in bold printing that she would instantly recognize, don't come home tonight. I don't want to see you. The doors will be locked. Go to your mom's, go to your sister's, or go home with Dan. It doesn't matter anymore. Don't call me tonight. I won't talk to you now. Call tomorrow if you have anything to say to me. You can say it then. I carefully folded it and got up. I walked to the bar and stood there for a few minutes, stoically watching Lisa and Dan as they started to get their coats on. A waitress came by, and I said, Would you like to make a $20 tip? She looked at me like I was crazy. Impatiently, I went on, See that woman near the dance floor in the green dress and black coat? Oh, sure. Lisa. I know her, and her boyfriend too. Disgustedly, I said, great, that's just great. Here's the twenty. Just walk over and give her this paper. She took the paper and the twenty dollars, looked at me, shrugged, and went toward the dance floor. I walked over to the entrance, turned, and watched, my mind numb, as the waitress approached Lisa and handed her the paper. Lisa said something to her, and the waitress said something back and pointed to the bar. Lisa unfolded the sheet of paper. One hand went to her lips, and I could almost hear her cry out above the sound of the music. Then she slowly crumpled to the floor as her startled lover tried to hold her up. Wearily, I turned and went out into the cold, snowy night. As I drove home, I could barely see through the tears in my eyes. This was the saddest day of my life. Everything I had believed in was shattered. Lisa had been everything I needed, and once upon a time, I was everything Lisa needed. Why had that changed? Was it all just a fairy tale? Were the signs always there, and was I just too complacent, too wrapped up in my own world, to see them? I got home before midnight. I paid off Carol, thanked her, and sent her on her way. I looked in on Maddie and again marveled at how beautiful and special she was. I tried not to think about what the next few days or weeks would bring. The phone started to ring. I unplugged all of them, dead bolted the doors, and went to bed. I was so exhausted that I fell instantly asleep. Amazingly, I slept for about seven hours and felt better than I deserved. Maddie would probably sleep at least another hour, so I started on my preparations. I knew I was in for another exhausting day. Around noon, I plugged the phone back in. Within minutes, it rang. When I picked it up, I heard Lisa's voice shaking. Can I come home now? I answered, the door is unlocked, and hung up. I started thinking about what was coming and knew the only way I could get through it was to harden my heart, let my anger out, and demand answers. Since the day I met Lisa, I had never raised my voice to her and had never felt anything other than love toward her. About twenty minutes later, she came in the front door. From where I was sitting in the kitchen, I could watch her. She looked around nervously, like she hoped to see Maddie. Finally, she slowly walked through the living room, dropping her coat on a chair. She saw me at the dining room table, where I often worked, with my briefcase and business files in front of me. We both looked at each other for a few minutes, and finally, I said, sit. She dropped into a chair and asked, where's Maddie? She's at my mom and dad's. They are keeping her tonight. She slowly nodded. First time I've seen you clean shaven in years. It was time, I simply said. Lisa looked haggard, like she had not slept. Her makeup was all washed off, and her eyes were red and swollen. Whose car is in the driveway? My brother's. He's using the truck to help someone move this weekend. Small talk exhausted us, and we sat in silence for a few minutes. Lisa was having trouble looking me in the eye. Finally, she cleared her throat and said, Alan, what you think you saw last night wasn't what it seemed. I just stared at her in disbelief. She was actually going to try to lie her way out of this. I see, I said. I pulled out our address book from under some papers and flipped it open to the Z's. 
I held it open in front of her and pointed to the initials she had put there. Jerry Drew is a stockbroker, Sharon Hughes is a real estate agent, and Steve Ostrander owns his own automotive services company. Don't you think a reputation for honesty is important to them? Do you think any of them would lie for you if subpoenaed to give a deposition under oath in a divorce action? The shock on her face dissolved into tears as she put her hands over her face and leaned over the table. Oh God, oh God, no. I was there from the time you arrived at the club until the minute you read my note. I know where you were going from there and who with. I just didn't have the heart to follow the two of you out to his van. I watched her shaking her head in disbelief. Lisa, I want the truth from you, all of it, from the beginning of our marriage until now. If you try to lie to me, I will know. A lot of things have become clear to me this week, and I want to know everything. I was practically yelling in her face as I finished. Lisa shrunk into her chair and turned away from me. She started to get up, but I grabbed her by the wrists. Sit down. You are not going to run away from this or from me. She collapsed back into the chair and covered her face with her hands, refusing to look at me. I got up, poured some vodka and tomato juice into a glass, and put it in front of her. I wanted her to talk and talk freely. I knew she didn't handle confrontations well, and combined with the emotional shock and a little vodka, I hoped it would help get at the truth. After a while, she put her hands down and looked at me pleadingly. Alan, please. I love you. She closed her eyes and shook her head from side to side. God, I never thought this would happen. What? That you would screw around on me or that you would get caught. I think I know which one it is. She started sobbing again. I waited a bit, then finally said, Tell me about Dan Burus. She started to dry her eyes and took a drink. Almost whispering, she said, I met Dan at the club. He was one of the guys in the group we always sat with. We danced quite a bit together and just kind of hit it off. That is certainly an understatement, I said harshly. And when did you start having sex with him? She cringed when I said that, turned away from me, and said slowly, we started sleeping together around January. He's married, no kids, older than us. He and his wife have an open marriage. And I bet you just happened to forget to tell him that we did not have an open marriage, didn't you, Lisa? Lisa didn't say anything. Come on, Lisa, you're leaving out a few things, aren't you? He makes a lot of money, wears expensive clothes, and drives expensive cars. He and his wife live in a very expensive house. She looked at me in shock. How, how did you know? I've been doing my homework. That's a high roller crowd you've taken up with, quite a different lifestyle than ours, at least from mine. She gulped down more of the drink, and I got up to get her a refill. Tell me, where did this sleeping around occur and how often? She looked down at her hands. She started talking so low I had to strain to hear her. Usually every Friday after leaving the club, we would go to his van in. She sat silent. What? You can't describe it? Screwing, humping, or even making love? After watching the two of you all evening, it was obvious you were lovers. I said bitterly. Anyway, it's a little late for you to try to spare my feelings. She looked up at me with tears in her eyes. What do you want me to say, Alan? I want you to say you're sorry, or that it was a mistake. I shouted. But an affair that has lasted nearly six months is not a mistake, is it? And the only thing you're sorry for is that you got caught. She started crying again and didn't say anything. Where else did you go? His house? Our house. Hotels? Motels? She wiped her nose and took another drink. We went to his house once, to a motel a couple of times, but never to our house. His house and his bed? I asked. She nodded. So where was Mrs. Dan? She was out of town for the weekend. What else, Lisa? Come on, don't be shy. I'm sure there's more. She sat silently for a few minutes, nervously gripping her glass and staring into it. We would meet for lunch once in a while, no sex, just lunch. Anything else? She shook her head. No. Slamming my fist on the table, I said, aren't you forgetting your big sailing weekend? I didn't think it was possible for Lisa to turn any paler. 
she had to be on the verge of passing out. I grabbed her as she started to slump to the floor. Recovering, she took a pull from her drink, hung her head in her hands, and started crying again. Finally, she gasped out, How, how do you know these things? Shaking my head, I said, Lisa, don't you get it? You were busted. You were ratted out. There are no secrets left. Now tell me about the weekend you were too busy working to go up north with your husband and daughter. Shuddering, she hugged herself with both arms. Dan is a friend who owns a sailboat he keeps over in Saugatuck. He invited Dan and me, and Connie and a guy she's been seeing, to go sailing over the weekend. You were already planning to work at your parents, so I told you I had to work so I could go, and you would take Maddie with you. I just looked at her disgustedly. I guess it no longer bothered you to outright lie to me. And how ironic, you practically refused to set foot on a rowboat on a tiny lake where mom and dad have their cottage, but you were willing to spend a weekend on Lake Michigan sailing. Not looking up, she said, we really didn't sail much. The water was calm, and we took the boat down the coast a bit and anchored about a half mile from the shore. I had a few drinks, which helped me relax. I just stared at her. So tell me, what did you do anchored offshore with all that privacy and relaxation? Did you run around the boat naked and have wicked sex with anyone and everyone? Practically stuttering, she said, We, we did sunbathe nude, but I only had sex with Dan in the cabin a couple of times. She paused for a minute, and I just stared at her, waiting. And then later, Dan and I stayed the night on the boat in the marina. Then, closing her eyes, she added, And when we took the boat out again on Sunday, I felt a sharp pain in my gut as it came back to me that we did not make love that Sunday night when I got back home. In fact, Lisa went to bed early, claiming she didn't feel well. The only time I can remember missing a weekend when she wasn't having her period. Now I knew why. Sarcastically, I said, Wow, you had quite a sex-filled weekend. You just had nothing left to give when your poor, clueless husband came home after being away from his loving wife for three days. Lisa didn't say anything just started crying again and shaking her head. We just sat there a while, Lisa sobbing quietly, and I lost in my thoughts. I finally got up and refilled her glass and put it in front of her. I didn't have to force myself to be angry anymore, I was angry. Lisa looked up at me tiredly. Please, please, I need to go lie down. Her voice shook and her hands could barely hold the glass to her lips. She was starting to slur her words a bit, and I knew exhaustion and alcohol were affecting her. I glared at her. Not yet, Lisa. We are not done here. Crying, she said, please, I've told you everything. Somehow, I don't think so. It's occurred to me to wonder how you were able to so easily slip into a long-term affair and keep it hidden, no change in your behavior, no change in your attitude toward me. I paused and said, could it be because this wasn't your first affair? that you have cheated on me before? Lisa looked at me with her mouth open, trying to say something. Then she closed it, looked away, and tried to talk again. It was obvious she was trying to figure out what she could get away with, and in her condition, she was having a tough time of it. I shook my head. Lisa, don't try to lie to me again. It won't work. Other people have been telling me things about you for years, and I didn't believe them. I refuse to believe them, my loving wife. I want to know everything, and I want to know now. Lisa slumped back into the chair, her eyes dull and half shut. Exhaustion and defeat were written all over her face and posture. In a monotone, she said, before Dan, I got hooked up with another guy down at the club. Only a couple of times, and then he stopped coming down there. I kind of figured as much from what the caller said, but I wasn't interested in that, I said flatly. Before that, Lisa. Lisa shut her eyes and sobbed. Once, the year before you started the business, I messed around with a couple of guys when you were working nights at the assembly plant, and they were. She opened her eyes and whispered, You know, don't you? I gritted my teeth and said, Say it. She said, John and Craig. I could almost feel the clunk as that piece of the puzzle fell into place. The suspicion had been in the back of my mind the last couple of days. Lisa was probably the best-looking woman in our social circle, and if John and Craig had hit on every good-looking woman they knew, why had they not hit on her? Of course, the answer was they had, but
but Lisa had never mentioned it. She would have if they had been unsuccessful or if she had been upset about it. And of course, John and Craig wouldn't tell me, but they ended at it after having a few too many beers, and I was too trusting to take them seriously. Not only had my wife betrayed me, but she had betrayed me with the two people that I thought of as probably my best friends, and one of them also happened to be my business partner. Sarcastically, I said, did you do them together or one at a time? She just stared ahead, focusing on nothing. You remember that time when Craig was stopped by the cop a mile from here for DUI? The cop let him off because he said he was going to his girlfriend's house just a few blocks away. I just grunted. I knew what was coming. He came in, and we had a couple of drinks. Maddie had been asleep for several hours. The cop followed him over here and wouldn't leave. He just sat in his car in front of the driveway. Craig suggested we turn off all the lights and act like we had gone to bed, so we did. When we went into the bedroom, we started making out. Her voice dropped. You know what happened next. Yeah, I know. Craig has told the story about the cops several times with a very different ending, at least it is when I'm in the crowd. After a few minutes of silence, I said, and John? A couple of weeks later, John showed up on a Friday night after happy hour. He was pretty loaded. We sat on the couch, watched TV, and had a few drinks. He started feeling me up and kissing me. He said he wanted me. I was having my period and told him that. He put my hand on his erection and told me he was really horny. I don't know why, but I told him I would give him a blowjob. I just stared at her in disbelief. Let me guess, a delivered in your mouth blowjob, wasn't it? Her head jerked up and her mouth hung open. Finally, she sputtered, he, he was supposed to warn me. Realizing how absurd that sounded, she looked away from me and hung her head. Not only was it turning out that my wife was a 304, but she was a dumb 304. Yeah, John loves to tell that story in the bar after a few beers, except in the version I heard, the recipient of his lust juice is Debbie Dawson. It was a little consolation to me that Debbie's husband, Dave, was probably as clueless as I was. I was sure Craig had told John he had gotten into Lisa's pants and that she was easy. There were no secrets between those two, and of course, John had beaten feet to our door knowing I was working nights. Lisa was crying continuously now, rocking back and forth, mumbling incoherently. Lisa, Lisa, I had to shout to get her attention. Look at me. How many times did you screw around with them? Without looking up, she said, Craig, he, he came around a couple of times after that, but then you started telling me what players they were and talked about everything they did. I got scared and told both of them not to come over anymore. Now I was really wondering if, at any time in her marriage, she had been faithful to me. I sat there thinking about it. Taking a shot in the dark, I said softly, and when I was in the army? Tell me about that, Lisa. Looking at me blankly, she said, Alan, please don't make me tell you. Lisa, tell me now. I could see her withdraw into herself, not able to resist anymore. Once, when you were on border patrol for the week, Kim Machado came over to take some pictures of Maddie. He had some hash with him. After Maddie went down for the night, he talked me into trying it. She looked up at me in desperation. Alan, we had been having sex every night since I got there. You had been gone four or five days, and I was horny. After smoking the hash, I just lost control. Kim Machado was a soldier in a different unit. We had met when we first got to Germany. He and his wife had a baby boy about Maddie's age. We got together a few times for dinner and playdates for the kids before his wife went back to the States. I heard they were having problems at the time she left, now I knew why. And after that? I asked quietly. He would come over once or twice every time you did your rotation to the border. I never smoked the hash again, but we kept having sex. Well, that certainly explains why he still calls a couple of times a year to invite us to visit him in New Orleans, I said sarcastically. Lisa collapsed onto her arms on the table and sobbed over and over again. I just looked at her, sure there was more, but I didn't think she could talk coherently. To be honest, I didn't think I could stand to listen to it. After a while, Lisa stopped crying and wasn't moving anymore. I think she was asleep. 
I sat there, dazed and lost in my thoughts. Finally, I got up and shook her arm. Lisa, get up. Get up and go get cleaned up. She finally roused herself, pulled herself out of the chair, and without looking at me, staggered down the hallway into the bathroom. As I heard the water in the shower turn on, I reached into my briefcase and turned off the recorder. As it sank in what I had heard, I jumped out of the chair, threw open the sliding glass door, dropped to my knees, and vomited into the snow. Wiping my lips with the back of my hand, I shut the door, slumped against the wall, and closed my eyes. The things she had told me were far worse than I had ever imagined. What happened to the woman I thought I married? As I sat there thinking about the past six years, I felt so stupid. I wondered how I ever got through a day. God, what a chump I'd been. My wife was not my wife, and my friends were not my friends. I knew there was no getting past this and that my entire life was going to change. While I sat there thinking, I heard the shower stop and Lisa go into the bedroom. Finally, I pulled myself to my feet and walked down the hallway. Lisa was collapsed across the bed on her stomach, naked and sound asleep. A week ago, the sight would have aroused me, and I would have jumped in bed with her in a second. I admired her long legs and beautiful body, but the realization that I was just one of many she shared herself with made me turn away in disgust. I walked back into the living room and threw myself on the couch. Within minutes, I was asleep. When I woke up a couple of hours later, all was quiet. I got up and fixed myself something to eat. I was just finishing a sandwich when I heard Lisa get up and go into the bathroom. A few minutes later, she appeared in the kitchen in her bathrobe. She looked at me with desperation. Alan, please, I love you. I always have. Without emotion, I said, then why, Lisa? You have hurt me in the worst possible way. I don't believe anyone could hate me enough to hurt me like this. How can you still say you love me? I don't know, Alan. I don't understand it myself. It just never seemed really wrong to me, I guess. I liked it when men paid attention to me, and when I was doing it, it was like I was someone else, just Lisa, not Lisa Baxter. You never found out, and it didn't seem to hurt anyone. It never changed how I felt about you, about us. Trying to hurt her, I said harshly, you know what a married woman is called who sleeps with other men? She just looked at me blankly. Ah, uh, 304. Lisa paled and put her hands in front of her face. Not only a 304, but a 304 who screwed my best friends and my business partner. Please, Alan, don't say that. That happened almost two years ago, and I regretted it. That was then, and this is now. That's your excuse for John and Craig? What about Dan Burus? Do you regret that relationship too? Lisa looked down at the table and whispered, it was more than just sex with Dan. We, we are friends. Please, Alan. Dan and I share a lot, music, dancing, things you were not part of and didn't seem to care about. I just stared at her in disbelief. That's your reason for betraying me in our marriage vows? Of course, by the time you met Dan, the point was moot. I drummed my fingers on the table, thinking about what she had just said. You want to continue your relationship with him, is that what you're saying? She didn't say anything, just kept staring at the table. And you think I should just sit back and accept it? Finally, she looked up at me hopefully. Listen, Alan, we could have an open marriage, too. An open marriage like Dan and his wife. We would still have each other, but we could both see other people. My God, this is just so surreal. And whose idea was this? I said slowly. Again, she wouldn't look at me. Dan and I talked about it a couple of times, but it never seemed to be the right time to bring it up. I couldn't help myself. I started shouting, you have been screwing around on me for our entire marriage, and when you get busted, your solution is to turn me into a cheat, too. If that is what you wanted, you should have told me before the very first time you screwed up. Then I could have made my own decision about what kind of marriage I wanted and how I wanted to live my life. Lisa just sat there, shaking her head, tears running down her face. I slumped back into my chair. Everything that I believed to be true about you and our relationship has been destroyed. Everything I thought I had learned over the last six years was exposed as a lie in just six days. 
Either you have been incredibly clever, or I have been incredibly stupid, I said in disgust. I suspected I knew which one it was. I shook my head and sat up straight. Lisa, you made the choices, but all of us will face the consequences, you, me, and Maddie. But you were too busy taking care of yourself to think about us, weren't you? It was all about you. No, no, it wasn't like that, Lisa whimpered. Lisa, I don't know who you are. I still love the woman I thought I married, I said. I shook my head. But maybe she existed only in my mind. I certainly don't love the woman you have become. We sat in silence for a few minutes as I gathered my thoughts and the courage to say what I had to say next. I intend to file for divorce. I have consulted an attorney. There should not be any issues regarding the division of property or alimony. I intend to file for joint custody. If you contest it, I will drag out everything you have done over the last six years for everyone to see. At the very least, you have proven yourself not to be a fit role model for our daughter. Lisa collapsed into the chair, crying. I just sat there, staring at the wall, lost in my own thoughts, thinking about the last six years, where we were going now, and how everything was going to change. I had been in my comfort zone for too long. I had forgotten the first lesson in life. Nothing stays the same. I waited for Lisa to get herself together. Her crying finally slowed, and I looked at her. This can happen one of two ways, Lisa, I said. She looked up at me in despair. I can walk out that door tonight and ask my parents to let me stay with them for a while. Of course, I would have to tell them everything, and tomorrow one of us would have to tell Maddie I no longer live here. Lisa shuddered when I said that. The other option is to wait until after the holidays. It's three weeks until Christmas. We can give our daughter as normal a Christmas as we can make it. It gives us some time to prepare her for what is going to happen, and we can try to keep this from your family in mind until after the new year. I saw some hope come into Lisa's eyes. I knew she was thinking if she could delay my leaving, anything could happen. I decided not to disabuse her of the notion for now. Please stay, Alan. I don't want you to leave. That decision has been made. The only question is when, I said. Lisa looked away from me and whispered, Please, please let's wait until after the holidays. With that decided, I had a bad taste in my mouth and an overwhelming desire to get away. I didn't want to look at her anymore, and I certainly didn't want to talk to her. Abruptly, I stood up. That's settled then. I'm going out. I won't be home until late. Without a backward glance, I went to the closet, got my coat, and walked out the door. I drove to the mall and wandered around for a while. I finally ducked into the movie theater to kill a few hours and occupy my mind. When it was over, I couldn't tell you what I watched. I decided to stop at a bar for a while to consider my next steps. As I sat there eating a greasy hamburger and fries, I decided the first thing I had to do was quit eating like this and take better care of myself. After that, I needed to address my marriage, get out of the construction business, and finish school, those would now take higher priority. I got home after midnight, and the house was dark. Going down the hallway, I could hear Lisa tossing and turning in her bedroom. There was no way I was going to sleep with her anymore. I would use Maddie's bed tonight and set something else up tomorrow. I woke up early and just stared at the ceiling in Maddie's room. With a pang, I remembered Sunday mornings when Lisa and I usually made love. Shaking my head, I started going over the things I needed to accomplish. Finally, with a groan, I hauled myself out of bed and into the bathroom. After cleaning up and getting dressed, I sat down at the kitchen table to finish my paperwork. I figured I needed about six more hours to finish it all, then I would call John and arrange to bring it over to him on Monday. Lisa got up and wandered into the kitchen. I simply ignored her and continued to work while she got some breakfast and sat down across from me. Finally, she said, where did you go last night? I shrugged. Does it matter? She asked, where did you sleep? In Maddie's room. Today, I will set up that extra twin bed in the basement. I will move my clothes and my dresser down there. I will sleep in the basement until I move out. That would be best for both of us. Lisa just looked down at her cereal, got up, and went back to the bedroom, closing the door. She didn't come out for the rest of the morning. 
Later that day, I set up the bed, moved my clothes and other stuff I needed downstairs, cleaned up the basement, and tried to make it somewhat livable. We had an old area rug and a beat-up old television that I set up. I spliced into the cable and connected the TV. I also had an old telephone around, so I hooked that up too, disconnecting the ringer and putting the phone behind the bed. Lisa tiptoed around me and didn't say anything, which suited me just fine. I went out to return the car and the camera to my brother. I told him I was going to hang onto the roll of film for now and we would talk about it later. I swung by mom and dad's and picked up Maddie on the way home. When Maddie burst into the house, she went straight to her mom to tell her all about her weekend. Apparently, Lisa was prepared, as she acted like nothing was wrong and made all the appropriate responses to Maddie's chattering. I followed Lisa's cue, and we both acted as if it was any other Sunday. Lisa had dinner prepared, and we all sat down to eat as if it was the most normal thing in the world. That set the pattern that was to last for as long as I remained in our home. When Maddie was home and awake, I stayed upstairs. We did all the things we normally did, watched TV, read the paper, played with Maddie, prepared meals, and cleaned up afterwards. But when Maddie went to bed for the night, I would spend the rest of the evening in the basement or leave the house. Needless to say, there weren't any displays of affection between us. Monday morning, we went about our routines like any other weekday. Lisa made a comment about not feeling like going to work. I told her bluntly that she was going to need her job and not to screw it up. I called John and told him I wanted to drop over with the end-of-year tax forms for signature. I stopped at the bank and took care of the things I needed to do. I finally pulled into John's driveway around noon. I knew his wife would be at work and his son at daycare. John and I usually got together a couple of days a week during the winter months to work on job bids, finish up paperwork, or sometimes just to hang out. I walked into his house with a big file box containing all the business files and forms we had accumulated over two years. John met me with a big smile and said, Hey Alan, why did you leave so early Friday night? You know the fun doesn't really begin until late. Then he noticed all the files I had with me. What the hell? Why did you bring all this stuff with you? I set everything down on the kitchen table and started pulling out files. Listen up, John. Here are the completed workman's comp insurance forms, the quarterly liability insurance forms, the IRS quarterly withholding statements, the end-of-year tax forms, and all the W-2s to be mailed after the first of the year. I have kept mine. I wrote the checks for the premiums and the withholding. You will have to sign them. I hesitated for a moment and looked John in the eye. Also, and this is important, here is a notarized letter of resignation from me as an officer of the company, effective today. Here is a signed receipt, again from me, for the amount of $2,500 received from the company in exchange for any and all interest in the company. That includes common stock, accumulated equity, and goodwill. I signed the check myself and cashed it this morning. It might leave you a little short of funds to start up in the spring, but I'm sure you'll come up with something. You might want to get down to the bank today and have my name removed from the bank accounts. John just stared at me, speechless. Finally, he got all red in the face and started waving his arms and shouting, What the hell are you doing? You can't do this. Oh, I can, John. And I did. Unless you want the reasons for my impending divorce to become very public, you won't make an issue of it. As it sunk in what I had just said, John closed his mouth and got very pale. But, but I don't know what you're talking about. I just glared at him. Don't insult me any further. I know where all the bodies are buried. Now, I don't want to see you or talk to you ever again. And that goes for Craig too. If I ever see either of you again, well, I think I could kick both your asses. As I walked out the door, I made one last parting shot. Tell your wife I won't be coming to your Christmas party. I will leave it to you to come up with a good reason. As I drove away, I felt better about myself. Finally, it was a first step to closing out the past and starting to look toward the future. The money took a little of the financial pressure off as well, but I had one more piece of personal retribution left to accomplish. I waited until about 4.30 and called the Buru's residence. I remembered from my surveillance that it appeared Patricia Burus arrived home quite a while before Dan. I hoped this was the case. A woman answered the phone. Burus residence. 
I asked if this was Pat Burus. She said it was. Remembering the shock I felt when I received my anonymous phone call, I resolved to be as gentle as I could be. I'm Alan Baxter. You don't know me, but my wife is a friend of your husband. I could hear the suspicion in her voice when she said, What is this about? Your husband has told my wife that you have an open marriage, so this probably means nothing to you. I recently found out they have been having an affair for over six months now, and I am filing for divorce because of it. I wanted you to know the consequences of his behavior and lies. As I thought to myself, there was a minute of dead silence. Son of a, that son of a, Alan, you said your name was? Yes. Well, we don't have an open marriage. He probably said that because he got away with it once and I forgave him. I have suspected him a couple of other times since then, but with my work, I have been too busy to keep tabs on him. I see now that was a mistake. Well, Pat, I am both glad and sorry to hear that. When Lisa, my wife, was busted, she tried to sell me on having an open marriage, like Dan said you two had. I couldn't imagine living like that. What proof do you have of this affair? She asked. I have her admission on tape and some photos of them together at the disco. They're not very explicit, but they show them hugging, kissing, and having a very intimate time together. I also have the names and phone numbers of others in their group who were aware of their affair. I could hear her cussing and swearing under her breath. Alan, can we get together and talk? I would very much like to hear the tape and see the pictures. I said that would be alright, but I needed a day to get the photos developed. We agreed to meet for lunch on Wednesday. I called my brother, and he gave me the name of a Photoshop that could do a rush job. I called them and arranged to drop off the film in the morning, and they would have it done before closing. I ordered two copies of everything and asked for at least five by seven prints if they could be printed that large and focused. After dropping off the film, I decided to go to the university and see if my advisor was available. He had some time, so we went over my transcript and determined I only needed three classes to get my degree. All of them were being offered during the winter term. Since I now had enough money to cover the tuition, I made plans to register right after the holidays. With that taken care of, I had been thinking I needed a source of additional income. Things were going to get tight financially. During the four years since I came off active duty, the Army Reserve and National Guard had been bombarding me with letters and calls trying to recruit me. I called recruiters from both to see what they had to offer. The Guard offered me a one-year trial enlistment at my old rank, and since I was prior service, I would qualify for a $500 bonus, half paid on signing in, the other half at the end of the year. The $500 would probably cover at least half of the divorce costs, so I thought that was a good deal. The one weekend a month would pay almost $200. The position they offered me was an admin role at state headquarters, which was less than 10 miles away. I thought, what the hell, one weekend a month and two weeks next summer was worth it. I accepted the offer that afternoon and made an appointment for later in the week to get processed. With things coming together, I started to feel a little more in control of my life. The next day was my lunch appointment with Pat Burus. I picked up the pictures and headed over to the restaurant. When I entered, I saw a lady standing by the cash register watching the door. I figured it had to be her, so I walked over and said, Pat. She smiled grimly and said, You must be Alan. I nodded and suggested we get a table. As we walked to the table, I observed that she was about 5 feet 8 inches, blonde, attractive, and very trim. She was dressed very businesslike and appeared to be probably older than Dan, maybe in her mid-thirties. As we sat down, we studied each other carefully. Finally, I suggested we order something and then talk. As we waited for our food, I gave her some background about myself, Lisa, and Maddie. She shook her head when she heard we had a daughter. She told me about herself and Dan. They met when they were both at college, she was two years ahead of him. After she graduated, they got married, and she started her own business. He eventually went into sales. They decided early on they didn't want kids. They had been married for over ten years now. After the food arrived, I started to tell her the story from the time I got the phone call until the morning of our confrontation. I gave her a copy of names and phone numbers from our address book. I then got out the tape recorder and started the tape. She listened intently as the tape played through Lisa's confession of the affair with Dan. 
Her face tightened when she heard the part about them going to her house. When the part about Dan was done, I shut off the tape. I didn't feel there was any need for her to know the rest. I got out the pictures and talked about what I saw at the club. The pictures were clear enough to show the two of them holding hands, kissing, and caressing each other. The looks on their faces were those of two people totally absorbed in each other. Pat had tears in her eyes when she finally put the pictures down. Thanks, Alan. Can I have copies of these? I said they were hers to keep. Pat dried her eyes and was quite composed as she said. Dan had an affair about five years ago that I found out about. We almost divorced over it, but he convinced me it was over and would never happen again. With my business, I am gone most weekends, so he has a lot of opportunities. I have suspected something was going on a couple of times since then, but it always blew over. She finally looked down at the table and sighed. This time it's the final straw. I don't need this or him. She looked up at me. I'm sorry about your marriage and about your daughter. I could tell she was hurting and trying to hold it in. I knew exactly what she was feeling. It's not your fault, I said. They're adults and made their choices. Now it's up to us to pick up the pieces and move on. We felt we had said everything that needed to be said and got up to leave. I gave her my phone number and told her to call if she needed anything or just to let me know how things were going. She smiled and said thanks. Sometimes it's good to know there is someone who understands what you're going through. As I went through the week getting my life rearranged in public, we pretended we were a happy family. Lisa tried to put a smile on her face when she was around Maddie, but when she was out of the room, she had this haunted look. At night, I could hear her crying in the bedroom after she went to bed. I felt a certain guilty satisfaction that maybe she was feeling some of the same pain I was experiencing. Several times, Lisa tried to get me to talk about us and the divorce, but I would just walk away from her. Finally, she gave up. I would talk to her about Maddie, paying bills, household chores, or Christmas. I did shock her when I told her I had enlisted in the National Guard. I also told her I was done with the construction business, and she didn't ask any questions. I called the attorney and instructed him to proceed with the divorce petition with irreconcilable differences as the grounds. I would drop off a check for the retainer before the end of the week. He said he would call me when the papers were ready to be served, and I could decide how I wanted it done. Before I went downstairs for the night on Thursday, I asked Lisa if she was planning on me babysitting for Maddie on Friday night. Lisa looked away from me and said, No, that's over with, Alan. I'm not doing that anymore. I just looked at her, shrugged my shoulders, and said, Whatever, before turning to go down the stairs. Desperately, she grabbed my arm and said, Wait, Alan. Don't walk away. I need to tell you something. I stopped and looked at her. Taking a deep breath, she said, I wanted you to know I am starting therapy next week. There is a psychiatrist I know at the hospital who has agreed to see me. It will be once a week on my lunch hour. I screwed up, and I don't know why. I know there must be something wrong with me, and I need to find out what. She finally looked me in the face with tears in her eyes. I just wanted you to know. I was at a loss for words. Finally, I said, Okay, Lisa, that's probably a good thing. I wish you luck with it, and I turned and went down to the basement. I didn't think therapy was going to change anything for us. What she had done was so flagrant, so painful, that I didn't think I would ever get over it. Most nights, I would toss and turn in bed, agonizing over the vision of her with another man, hearing her in my mind gasping and moaning in pleasure, or seeing her with John in our living room. Finally, after a couple of hours, I would fall asleep in exhaustion. School finally let out for the holiday break, and we had started the run-up to Christmas. It was hard to get into the Christmas spirit, but we finally let Maddie convince us to put up the Christmas tree and decorations. Lisa and I agreed to give each other one gift so Maddie would not be suspicious. We would also honor our tradition of filling up our Christmas stockings with candy and small personal items. Maddie was always thrilled to dump out our stockings on Christmas morning to see what everyone got. We limited our social events to only family gatherings. Some of our friends kept calling, asking why we weren't coming to their holiday parties. John's wife, Karen, called Lisa and was insistent about knowing why we couldn't make their party. We made a variety of excuses and tried to minimize any discussion about it. 
I think Lisa had confided in her sister, as there were some awkward moments with her family. My mother had noticed that something was wrong with Lisa and that she seemed to be losing weight, and asked me about it. I just shrugged and said she had been fighting a bug lately. I don't think she bought it but didn't say anything else. We finally got through Christmas Eve and Christmas Day. Maddie had a great Christmas, and we spoiled her as we usually did. I tried to treasure every moment with her. A couple of times, she asked me why I was looking at her funny. Once she said that in front of both of us, and when Lisa saw the tears in my eyes, she turned away with a sob and left the room. A couple of days after Christmas, the attorney called to say the divorce petition was ready. I told him to go ahead and file it. It would probably be listed in the paper the following week and become public knowledge. I decided to stop and pick up a copy for Lisa and give it to her myself. I had toyed with the idea of having her served publicly to maximize the hurt but finally decided that there was enough pain going around already. That same day, Lisa came home from work, visibly upset and having been crying. I had tried to separate myself from her emotional well-being ever since I confronted her. She said she had to tell me something after Maddie went to bed. Lisa was barely holding it together through dinner. When Maddie finally went to bed, she sat down across from me. Dan Burus called me today. I haven't spoken to him since that night. He called to tell me his wife filed for divorce. I just looked at her and didn't say anything. He said she had pictures of the two of us together and that she got them from you. Is that true? I said yes. She started crying. I asked him why the divorce if they had an open marriage, she said. He said that wasn't exactly true. She looked up at me with tears running down her face. He lied to me, Alan. He lied to me. I just shook my head. Lisa, he is a player, and he played you. He told you everything you wanted to hear. I turned and went down the stairs. After that, Lisa became more haggard and tired. She seemed to be nauseous a lot and didn't have much of an appetite. I knew the stress was getting to her, like she was waiting for the other shoe to drop. I wondered if she was getting an ulcer, but she managed to drag herself into work every day. I had been going through the classifieds trying to find a place nearby that I could afford. I knew I would have to continue to subsidize the rent on the duplex for a while, as the costs were beyond Lisa's means on her own income. I finally concluded that I would need another full-time job if I was going to have my own place. It would be tough taking three classes and working full-time, but I would only have to do it for the winter term. I made the trip down to the employment office of the auto assembly plant to see what they might have. I had worked for them a couple of times in the last few years and had some contacts with the staff. They had a few non-union 90-day temp jobs available on the second shift. If I was interested, it would pay about twice what unemployment paid, so it would be enough for what I needed. I signed up and would start the week after New Year. The holiday weekend was starting the next day. I had no desire to celebrate the New Year but I didn't want to stay around Lisa either. Being in the same house with her day after day was killing me. I knew I still loved her and hated her at the same time. I asked her if she had any plans, and she said no. I told her I needed to get away for a while. I would go up to mom and dad's cabin for the weekend. It would be cold, but maybe I could do some cross-country skiing. It would give me an opportunity to clear my head. I wanted to get my thoughts together before I gave her the divorce papers. I got back on Sunday afternoon. The time away had helped, and I was feeling a little more relaxed. Lisa was in the living room watching television when I walked in. As usual, she didn't say anything to me. Finally, I asked where Maddie was. She said she took her to her mom's for the day. I thought to myself this would probably be the best opportunity to do what had to be done. I went and got my briefcase and sat down next to her on the couch. I took out the manila envelope. Lisa, we might as well do this now. These are the divorce papers. You should get a lawyer and have him review them. I did not file on grounds of adultery but on grounds of irreconcilable differences. As Lisa reached out to take the envelope, her hand shook and she started crying. She put her head down in her lap and sobbed huge, gut-wrenching sobs. Listening to her made me tear up, but I held myself in and waited for her to get a hold of herself. I got up and left. I never tried to speak to her again. She called multiple times, 
but I never answered. After seven months, we were finally divorced. I got a house nearby, and it was easy for Maddie to come and go. It was hard to answer her whenever she asked why I was not at home with her mom. I always told her, when you grow up, you'll understand. Lisa, meanwhile, had descended into heavy depression and seemed to be on some heavy narcotics. A few weeks later, I got a call from her parents saying she was hospitalized. I rushed to the hospital and saw that Maddie was crying. Daddy, Daddy, Mommy is not talking. She is sick. I held her close and tried to calm her down. I went in to see Lisa, and she did not look good. Her mom told me that she had been found unconscious in the bedroom. Although it was hard to see her in this condition, my only concern was my daughter. I asked the doctor about Lisa's condition. He informed me that Lisa had overdosed on her medication and alcohol. I didn't spend much time there and took my daughter home the very next day. I called CPS and asked my lawyer to file for sole custody of my daughter. I also called my ex-mother-in-law to inform her, and she was livid. She called me all sorts of names and accused me of being heartless for taking her granddaughter away. I didn't say much and just hung up. The judge, after reviewing the situation, awarded custody to me and ordered Lisa to undergo rehabilitation and reevaluation. Lisa was released from the hospital and moved into rehab. I never saw her again. As for what happened to her lovers, John lost his business and had to file for bankruptcy. Craig met with an accident and is currently disabled for life. Kim Machado was killed in a training exercise when he fell from a chopper. Dan's wife divorced him and left him without any money. He tried to confront me once at a local bar. It did not go as planned. Not only did I end up breaking some of his bones, but he was also beaten by the bouncers. Once I was done with the confrontation, Maddie and I lived a happy life. She misses her mother, but I told her that she will be back once she is healed. As for me, I am content. I just love my daughter and work hard to provide for her so I can give her all the happiness in the world. I don't have any other desires.